Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Rafael Medina specialty via Mar. We are super excited to be here today with our guest. We have uh, Dr. Kevin Hamigan, that is an assistant professor of clinical medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine and Public Health in the Department of Medicine at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. He has been a full-time hospitalized since 2017 and split his time between Nashville VA Medical Center and VUMC. And Dr. Hemmingen, do you want to say hello and introduce yourself? Hey, sure. Yeah, I think you, you just you just did most of it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a hospitalist at Vanderbilt and the VA. Um, been here since 2017. Um, you know, really enjoy uh, really enjoy clinical reasoning. I'm really just sitting at the at the bedside and, and getting a, a great history uh, from patients and hopefully setting an example for students and residents. And um, I think patient education and transitions of care are incredibly important. And then um, just kind of taking that journey to arrive, uh, hopefully arrive at the at the right diagnosis. And so uh, uh, we'll 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 take the journey to arrive at the diagnosis, and then uh, hopefully Dr. Mota will will take us home, and maybe I'll get it, and maybe I won't. <laughs> And we like to ask a question, what you like to do outside of medicine, something fun. Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't have any, uh, and I, I talk to residents about this all the time. It's like, yeah, you, you got to have something that you like to do outside of medicine. I don't have anything, I say like in in particular, uh, you know, I'm not not a huge hobby guy, but I guess uh, lately we've got a little uh, a, a garden going outside, uh, you know, summer's summer is quite good for uh uh, for for growing some veggies in in Nashville, so we've got some some peppers and green onions and and kale going, and so uh, that's that's kind of been the thing. And then and then just doing anything out in the parks or seeing some live music in Nashville with uh, with my wife and my eight year old daughter. <laughs> yeah, Nashville is really famous for the music. Everyone said that they they have really good music in Nashville. Uh, you get you go anywhere like there's a farmer's market on Saturday mornings down the road and there's like there's live music at the farmer's market it's just like <laughs> it's just a normal a normal thing here <laughs> amazing and then we have our case presenter today is Dr. Danielle Malta Calderon that is like a PGI2 of internal medicine resident in Vanderbilt and if you want to introduce yourself and and tell us what you like to do for fun too yeah, well, thanks so much for having me here. Um, I'm I'm just pumped because uh, I remember joining the Clinical Problem Solvers as a um, um, participant er earlier uh, when, the, when the pandemic hit, and um, it was such a uh, lifesaver at that time as uh, we had so much uncertainty going on in the world. I felt like Clinical Problem Solvers um, was a um, a great resource to connect to people uh, in other parts of the country and uh, um, worldwide. So I'm very grateful for um, your efforts and I'm very happy to see how much you've grown. Uh, I'm very happy to be here as a case presenter. Outside of medicine, uh, I like to skip a dive um, and uh, I am into CrossFit recently. Um, so it's a great way to um, relieve some stress. Uh, really uh, passionate about uh, clinical reasoning, um, diagnostic safety, um, and diagnostic errors in the inpatient setting. Thanks for having us. Daniel, where do you go to CrossFit at? Because I go on the west side uh, on Charlotte, but like, you know, I didn't want to be that guy that talked about CrossFit. <laughs> Please <laughs> join it. Uh, I go to you on the end. It's uh, next to Centennial Park. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah I, know, I know what you're talking about. Okay. Oh, please join us. <laughs> I'm into CrossFit too. I, I really like it. So I think we can have our whiteboard and you can start the case, Dr. Mata. All right, great. So uh, you guys uh, can tell me when to stop. Uh, we'll do the other quotes. Um, so this is a 79-year-old uh, uh, gentleman who was transferred from an outside hospital um, with a chief complaint of um, ultramental status um, and rectal bleeding. So this is, uh, um, as I said, he has a past medical history of uh, dementia. He's currently uh, living in, at a, a skilled nursing facility. Um, he has history of GERD, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. Uh, he had a, a history of prostate cancer. Uh, he underwent radiotherapy um, 
we don't know what the stage of his prostate cancer is. Um, he has sleep apnea. Uh, he has had prior episodes of aspiration. He uh, is dependent on a PEC tube. Um, he has complex uh, sacral ulcers, specifically a sacral ulcer that's stage four. And he had been recently diagnosed with osteomyelitis. Uh, he's on chronic antibiotic suppression therapy. He's on vancomycin three times a week. Um, he also has anemia of chronic disease. So basically, uh, the story is um, he has he came he he was transferred from a hospital for five days of decreased interaction, uh, just uh, more somnolence, inability to recognize caregivers, um, and uh, at the sniff, and as well as his family members. He also had some urinary retention uh, for which he had uh, undergone uh, intermittent uh, in, in, in and out catheterizations, uh, leading to hematuria. Uh, in addition to that, he's been having bruises in his arms and in his legs, as well as some epistaxis. Um, we uh, getting more history um, and, and from Handa from um, the outside hospital. We found out that one day prior to admission to our hospital, uh, he started developing painful blisters on his legs um, with worsening pain. Um, as well as worsening pain around the sacral ulcer that uh, we already knew. Um, he uh, also started having hematochesia. So the hematochesia was described as bright red blood, bright red blood um, that was filling his diaper. Uh, it was uh, painless. Uh, he did not feel any pain when he was uh, having these episodes of hematochesia. Uh, he was also found to have a slurred speech at the Alta Hospital, um, as well as a, a left facial droop. Um, he underwent a CT and an MRI that didn't show evidence of stroke or um, intracranial bleeding. And at the Alta Hospital, he was found to have a hemoglobin of 6.6 .6 with a low hematocrit of 23. Uh, he received two units of play, uh, sorry, two units of red blood cells, um, and then he was transferred to our hospital for further um, management. Um, should I stop here and ask? Uh, please guys... do. <laughs> <laughs> and please ask me, ask me as many questions as you want. As you want. Um, okay. So, yeah. So if, if anyone else's brain feels a little overwhelmed, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll take a step back and I, I, I will ask you, cause is he being transferred? Um, is he be, is he coming to Vanderbilt or is he coming to the VA? He's coming to the VA. He's coming that's, to the VA. Okay, okay. That's why that's so, why he's transferred because uh, he's a veteran. And he because he's a veteran. Yeah. Okay, you know that makes me that makes me think think about things a little bit. You know, if he was coming to Vanderbilt, I'd say, oh my, he, you know, someone thinks that maybe he's got some you know crazy complex process that they're not exactly sure how to manage. So I mean, this still could be. Um, but okay, so he's coming to the VA because because he's a veteran, and so and so we're we're dealing with here we're, we're dealing with a lot. We're dealing with a, a chronically sick gentleman, and for me, for me right now, I'm I'm focusing on this acute on chronic mental. The things that stood out to me: acute on chronic change in his mental status. He's got chronic neurocognitive disorder. He's got this sacral ulcer. He's got a, a peg, but but then um, but then we've got this story of you know he's is he's bleeding from another mucosal site. He's bleeding from the nose. He's also bleeding from the rectum. Um, and then he's got these blisters on his leg. So it, you know at at first this sounded like a very kind of common presentation, gentleman with um, dementia who could certainly be altered just from a lower GI bleed, but it sounds like there's, there may be some, there's maybe something more systemic going on. So I, I feel like when, when I've got multiple problems going on, sometimes I have to think about a differential for, for each one kind of, or else my brain starts to get overwhelmed. Um, so from an encephalopathy standpoint, uh, you know, and I think it, it'll be helpful once we see his, his med list too, but from, you know, if we're thinking just from a structural cause, he's, he's bleeding from his GI tract, he's bleeding from his nose. Could he be, could he have a CNS bleed? Could he have a, um, a subdural hematoma? We don't have a history of fall, but he's been confused. So who knows? 
Um, at first, I thought infection was up there. Did he? Does he have some super infection of this uh, of this sacral wound? He's not really given the history um, of a pneumonia, um, but he's got an aspiration. Certainly has aspiration risks. Um, you know, the the he's having um, a GI bleed. Could he be volume depleted and altered from the GI bleed? And now he's got renal failure. Um, and, and a mild degree of, of dehydration and uremia. Um, is there some other, is, uh, is the patient bacteremic with, he's, he's got a, a number of potential sources, um, the sacral wound, the osteo, um, patient has urinary retention, could they have a simple UTI? They've got a peg tube, could, you know, could there be some, some um, kind of peri peg tube site cellulitis going on? Um, the, the concerning thing to me just overall, though, that, that I wasn't expecting is these the bruises, the epistaxis, um, and then in conjunction with the lower GI bleed, that starts, that, that gets me thinking about uh, a bleeding diathesis. And, you know, if we're not having lar bleeding into large joints, I'm thinking, you know, the, the gentleman is certainly has risk factors just even just with his age for a coagulation defect, either a deficiency or an inhibitor. Um, but for some reason, you know, I think because of the, the sites of mu potential mucosal bleeding, my mind is either going to thrombocytopenia or some reason for a, maybe an acquired platelet dysfunction. Um, is the gentleman, um, It'll help to see the labs. I think that the I, uh, PT, the PTT, the platelet count will be helpful. But then I'm also thinking about, um, I don't know how this gentleman's nutrition is. The, the hope would be that he's getting nutrition, good nutrition from his peg tube, but could he have something like, um, uh, like vitamin, like a significant vitamin C deficiency? Um, and then, but then with the blisters on the leg, then is there, is there another systemic process at play? Um, you know, given his age, is this something like uh, bullous pemphigoid or um, pemphigus vulgaris? Vulgaris can have sites of mucosal involvement. Um, are, are the blisters really kind of like a, a palpable purpura and are we dealing with kind of a multi-system um, vasculitic process? So I think the differential is very, very, very broad. We've got to resuscitate this gentleman, treat the GI bleed acutely, and stabilize him. But he's certainly, and I'm sure, and, and you'll get into it. I'm sure. I think he certainly needs a a much a much bigger, broad workup. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was a, a really big approach of this chief complaint. Yeah, if Dr. Mata can continue with more information. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about his medications. He was on uh, memantine, uh, metformin, uh, mirtazapine, um, aspirin, uh, allopurinol for gout, as well as uh, doxazosin for uh, urinary retention, uh, as well as some iron. Um, we did not get any uh, family history because um, he was transferred from the Alta hospital and um, he did not, he, he just, he didn't remember any family history. Um, he has a memory impairment, uh, secondary his dementia. Um, from a social history perspective, we also didn't get much information. Uh, he was retired. He was a veteran. Um, unknown exposures, uh, unknown uh, um, deployments, uh, and then no known allergies per uh, chart review. Should we go ahead and uh, give you guys the first uh, set of vitals? Yes, please. Okay, so initial temperature upon admission was 35.1, um, pulse was 75, respirations were 15, uh, blood pressure blood pressure was 133 over 111. Um, he was setting 98% on room air. His BMI, I do not have his BMI, but I do have his weight, 270 pounds, um, and his height was 182. Uh, on exam, um, he was awake, uh, he was alert, uh, only oriented to self um, and to place, um, not specifically, he didn't tell us he was at the VA, he just told us he was at a hospital. Uh, he was comfortable, um, as I said, elevated BMI, at least uh, obesity um, or overweight. He had his pec tube in his mid-upper abdomen, uh, he had a Foley catheter in place that was draining yellow urine, 
but he did have some uh, oozing uh, in his urethra. Um, his conjunctival was clear. His, um, me, his, his mucous membranes were, were moist. Um, he had a supple neck, uh, no JVD. Uh, his cardiovascular exam, he had a regular uh, rhythm, um, no murmurs that I could appreciate. Uh, we did a point of care ultrasound um, that uh, didn't show any pericardial effusion. Um, his EF looked grossly normal, but um, not the best operator. Um, his uh, respirations, uh, he, did, he had normal um, respiratory excursion. He was speaking in full sentences, um, no, sec no secondary use of, 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 uh, of respiratory muscles, uh, no tachypnea. He had A-lines. Um, he had um, pleural sliding bilaterally on, on POCUS. Um, his abdomen was soft, no signs of peritoneal irritation. Uh, he had some oozing of r r red blood, um, red blood, uh, bright red blood uh, through his anus. He had a uh, anal fissure. Um, so he was oozing from the fissure, but he was he was also oozing from his rectum, from his from his anus. Um, he, as I said, he had a foley, um, and he's um, in terms of extremities, um, he had some plus one pitting edema. Um, he had strong pulses bilaterally, um, and he was warm with a capillary refill less than um, two seconds. Um, skin wise, um, he had uh, these. Fluid um, bullae. Uh, there were about seven centimeters uh, with no surrounding erythema. Um, one was already popped, um, but the other, uh, the others were filled with um, serous uh, fluid. Um, he also had uh, a seven by seven um, centimeter ulcer uh, in, his, in his sacrum. Uh, with some granulation tissue, uh, no other local signs of inflammation. Um, it did not. He did not have any um, active purulence or drainage from that um, ulcer. Um, and uh, it's pretty much it. In terms of his neuro exam, uh, again, known focal. He was moving four extremities spontaneously. Um, strength was five out of five. Yeah. Do you do you know if those bullae were they Nikolsky positive? I did not do the Nikolsky sign. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, uh, there were tents. Um, there were tents. Okay. One was already popped, and uh, <clears throat> he had like other other three boule. Uh, there were tents. Um, some some tenderness um, around the boule. Okay, and um, uh, it sounds like nothing nothing in the mouth. Nothing in the mouth. Okay. And then where are these distributed? Are they on on the lower extremities only? Yeah, so it was uh, um, in his uh, around his shins. Uh, so anterior legs, uh, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't have any special special distribution. Uh, they were in his uh, anterior legs, uh, more medial than lateral. Um, that's pretty much it. Okay, all right. So you know the the things on exam that stand out to me. So um, he's hypothermic, which uh, immediately makes me think: could there be uh, could there be a, a, an infectious process? Is this, uh, I don't, well, we'll see if he fulfills kind of other um, SERS criteria, but with the encephalopathy and the hypothermia, uh, although he's not tachypnic uh, or hypotensive, um, sensitive markers um, for sepsis. So that's where my mind goes. I, I find it odd um, that his heart rate, you know, the gentleman sounds sick uh, and his heart rate is only 65. He's not on any um, AV nodal blocking agents. You know, sometimes sometimes you'll see that on um, patients with dementia that are on like an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor like denepazil, right? Because that increases acetylcholine in, uh, in the synapse and that'll cause bradycardia. But I can't, uh, I don't associate any of his medications that he's on um, with bradycardia. Um, otherwise though, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit reassured. It sounds like the outside hospital resuscitated him well. You know, the, the oozing again, kind of, I guess I wanna say from multiple sites, but I don't wanna put words in your mouth because it doesn't sound like he had epistaxis or bleeding from any IV sites, but this gentleman sounds quite sick. Um, and, you know, could he be in DIC? Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about that as well. So I'm thinking about um, a, a coagulopathy. Um, I think you've got to think about is, is this something involving the intrinsic or extrinsic pathway? Is it involving um, 
um, kind of your terminal pathway and like fibrinogen production. Um, so that, that or or platelet or platelet count or platelet function. So that's the bleeding piece. And then these these bullae, you know, there's there's a broad differential for bullae. And this is something that I, you know, I probably only see a couple of times a year. And whenever I do, I just have to go to like my resource of choice and look at look at the differential. But common things being common and, and what I've seen before, right? A 70-year-old gentleman with new bullae, uh, to me, from what I know about um, bullus pemphigoid, uh, I, that would be at the, the top of my differential. Now, I don't know if it explains the entire process, but bullous pemphigoid can be associated with malignancy. Um, so does this patient have an underlying malignancy, potentially GI? And malignancies then right, are associated with DIC or they're associated with factor inhibitors that um, can lead to coagulation defects. Um, so... That's that's where my mind is going. Um, they don't sound super infected to me. This doesn't sound like um, pemphigus. Uh, this doesn't sound like pemphigus vulgaris. Looking at his medication list, uh, it's probably hard to know if any of these are new. But a medication that sticks out to me, just because I could, I know that it can cause a lot of adverse effects, including like hypersensitivity reactions. Um, I want to say it can affect the bone marrow, but I'm not entirely sure about that. But allopurinol certainly um, has has known hypersensitivity reactions. This doesn't sound like um, kind of a delayed hypersensitivity that, that I'm that I'm used to seeing. Something that's like delayed and T cell mediated. Um, but I but I I, I guess that it's possible. Um, so that's. That's what I'm thinking about right now. I'm not. I'm not focused in too much on on this ed, edema, um, but really the the bullae and the oozing from multiple sites, along with the hypothermia, um, are are what I focused in on. Great. I, I saw some questions in the chat. I'm I'm trying to get uh, answer some of those questions. He has not received any uh, recent radiotherapy, at least not in the last six months. The reason why he had the PAC tube is because he had recurrent aspiration in the setting of his worsening dementia. Uh, so they, 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 they put the PAC tube to try to minimize aspiration. Um, and um, I think those were the two questions. And then for how long he's had osteomyelitis? Uh, for the past three months, um, and he's been on vancomycin. Um, I'm not sure for how long, but at least for the past three weeks or so. Okay. Um, so should I go ahead and, uh, give you guys some laughs? I yeah, think that I would be helpful. <laughs> All right. So as <laughs> I said, um, he had a head CT and an MRI at the outside hospital that ruled out any acute intra intracranial hemorrhage, uh, no acute strokes. Um, white count was 11.7. Uh, his hemoglobin was 7.9 after he received two units of blood. Uh, his, um, hemoglobin at the outside hospital was 6.6, .6, I believe. Um, his uh, platelet count was 348,000. His uh, differential was significant for a, a neutrophil count of 6,000, a lymphocyte count of 1,700, uh, monocytes uh, 460, that's normal, uh, e an absolute eosinophil count of 3,100, normal basophils, um, and then uh, no blasts. Uh, that were seen. Um, he had a BMP, a B Nancy P of 96, a PT of 14.6, a PTT of 107, an INR of 1.1, fibrinogen was 383. He had a, a normal troponin of a 0 0.01. He had an EKG um, with a normal PR interval with a narrow QRS. Uh, he had a normal QT, um, thing was 460, no ischemic changes, no repolarization abnormalities. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of chemistries, um, he had normal, relatively normal electrolytes. Uh, sodium was 143, potassium was 4.5, chloride was a little bit high, 108. 
uh, his bicarb was 27.8. Uh, uh, glucose was slightly elevated, 188. Um, BUN was 90, uh, was 25. Uh, creatinine was normal, 0.74. Calcium was 8.6. Uh, magnesium was 1.7. Um, and um, yes, I think that's all I have for you guys for now. I think this is a good time to stop and think. A lot of stopping and thinking on a on a good uh, a great hematology case. So, um, and I might have to ask you just to to double check. So it, he's got a significantly high um, eosinophil count. Is is that okay? The neutrophils of six thousand. Is that a is that a monocytosis of four fifty? I'm I don't I don't have that. No. I don't remember those. Really, he just had the uh, eosinophilia. Um, just the eosinophilia. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it is not, it was not monocytosis. As really okay. Eosinophilia. And that, I got to say that we went back to his uh, VA records and he had been at the VA six months prior. Um, and, uh, eosinophils were, um, normal. Okay. And then on his, on his coags, the, that PTT is incredibly long. Um, you know, You'll, you'll, and this gentleman's not on, on, not on any anticoagulants. You'll see on the inpatient side, um, the, the PTT mildly prolonged. I would, uh, I don't actually, I don't want to make the assumption, especially with his bleeding, um, that he was getting DDT prophylaxis, but somebody that's getting a noxaparin or that's getting, um, heparin prophylaxis, you know, they'll have a, a mildly long PTT, but, but nowhere, um, near, uh, that degree. So, um, but just that prolonged PTT, you know, first that's surprising, but in, in the clinical, in the clinical scenario, um, doesn't shock me and certainly like raises, raises my interest for probably right at the age of 79, a, an acquired coagulopathy, um, of the, uh, oh, I'm going to get this this, someone tell me, is this intrinsic or extrinsic pathway? I think it's intrinsic pathway, right? Um, but, for, you know, for, what, what I would do first before going down the rabbit hole is I, I immediately after I saw that, I would recheck that PTT. Um, and things that I associate with a prolonged PTT would be, um, like I mentioned, heparin product. So heparin drip, DVT, prof, you know, um, prophylactic dose, heparin, anoxaparin, lupus anticoagulant will cause a prolonged PTT. I don't know the typical range, but I, I, I don't, you know, recall seeing it to that degree of elevation. Um, I think because von Willenbrand factor carries factor eight, right? If you've got severe von Willenbrand disease, you can get a, a, a prolonged PTT. Um, but what I'm most worried about, what I'm most worried about is, is an acquired, uh, like an acquired coagulopathy, like a factor inhibitor, maybe a fa like a factor eight inhibitor. Um, I, I think there's one more, there's one more um, coagulation factor in the PTT pathway, but factor eight is the one that I think about um, most commonly. And then, so that's that's the coagulopathy piece. And then the eosinophilia piece, is this, is this secondary, um, you know, is this, is this a hyper eosinophilic syndrome with, with multi-organ involvement, uh, you know, predominantly GI? I'm worried about, is this a primary marrow process? He's got a primary myeloproliferative neoplasm. Um, and those are certainly associated uh, with factor inhibitors, and, and I'm not sure, but potentially um, factor deficiencies. Um, is there, is one of these medications new? Is maybe this allopurinol new? He's got a hypersensitivity reaction, and we're seeing a kind of a robust, uh, a robust eosinophil response. Uh, I, I find it unlikely that there's, uh, unless we got something on the social history or travel history, unlikely that there's a, that there's a, a, a parasitic process here at play. Um, so, but, but certainly the, the eosinophilia and, and the prolonged PTT are, 
are most concerning. I, I think what I'd like to see, what I'd like to see next, um, I'd like to see a, a PTT mixing study and see if that PTT corrects. And and then uh, you know, a li- sorry, a life threatening process. I think with that eosinophilia would be like a hyper eosinophilic syndrome. And so does again, does he have? And if I didn't mention this already, kind of multi organ uh, infiltration. Great. I think those are um, great thoughts. Um, some of those thoughts cross our mind uh, while we were taking care of this patient. Some others uh, did not. Um, uh, I can I can give you some more data um, in terms of uh, some of the things that we ordered. Um, we ordered a, a CK um, that was normal. Um, we were concerned about his hypothermia. So we ordered a TSH uh, that was normal, was 0.9. CK was 19. Uh, his free T4 was uh, um, 0.9. Uh, also concerned about malnutrition, uh, we ordered vitamin levels. Uh, B12 was uh, actually high. Um, his A1C was uh, f- 5.8%. Uh, we got an ABG, sorry, it was a, a BBG um, that showed a, a pH of uh, 7.39 with a PCO2 of 42 um, some other significant workup, um, we, um, uh, got complement levels, uh, complement level, uh, he had a mildly low, almost normal C3 of 70, 78, C4 was normal as well as 20, um, repeat PTT was, uh, elevated, uh, as well as his, uh, his INR was still one, repeat PTT, uh, was 95, um, so that was still high. Um, his chest x-ray, uh, didn't show any evidence of airspace disease, no pleural efficiency. Um, he had a uh, mildly enlarged, uh, cardiac silhouette, uh, but nothing else in his, uh, chest x-ray. Um, do you want any specific imaging? Um, yeah, so uh, I, I will say, and you, You'll see this sometimes, and it's not to be ignored, but a, a high B12, like our lab reports, um, greater than 2,000. And so in this scenario, um, and, and I don't exactly, I don't remember the mechanism behind it, the pathophysiology, but if you see a, a markedly elevated B12, especially in someone that's not um, on supplementation, you should be thinking about a primary marrow, like hematologic process. Um, a primary bone marrow malignancy, if the clinical picture fits. In in isolation, I, I don't necessarily know what to make of it, and I wouldn't be too concerned. But with the clinical picture, that even that raises my suspicion even more um, for uh, for a primary marrow process or some type of some type of hematologic malignancy. I think you know. I think in um, I think in this gentleman, I probably. I probably would want uh, a CT of the abdomen and pelvis with contrast. You know, if he's actively bleeding, it may be helpful to get the CTA, although although he's hemodynamically stable. And so I, I think just a CT abdomen and pelvis with contrast, right? Because um, other hematologic malignancies, maybe that are causing lymphadenopathy, something like a, a 79, a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, could also uh, could could also cause the eosinophilia um, and potentially uh, an acquired uh, an acquired coagulopathy. So I, I'd say CT abdomen and pelvis with contrast. Well, um, six hours uh, after he was admitted, uh, he became acutely tachycardic uh, to the one fifties. Uh, he became hypotensive, uh, so we could not take him to the scanner. Um, we were, um, he, he started having oozing, more oozing, uh, through his rectum and in his perianal region, um, we had to activate the massive transfusion protocol. He, uh, received multiple, uh, blood products, um, as part of the, um, transfusion protocol. Uh, we gave him fibrinogen, uh, we gave him, uh, for thrombin, um, concentrate, um, and, uh, we were able to transiently stabilize him. Um, and we got the CT abdomen pelvis. Um, so in that CT abdomen pelvis, um, he didn't have any acute intra-abdominal or pelvic processes. 
Uh, he had um, extensive colonic diverticulosis uh, without diverticulitis, uh, no bowel obstruction, no pneumoperitoneum, um, the gastrectomy tube looked fine. Uh, he was not oozing uh, from any of his um, IV sites. Uh, he was not oozing from his uh, MAC. He had a MAC because he was. We had to activate the massive transfusion protocol, um, and uh, the PEG tube looked fine on that uh, CT scan. Um, so um, the CT scan was not really helpful. Uh, he had some atelectasis in his lungs, um, but no, no other thing uh, in the basis of the lungs. Uh, no aortic aneurysm. No aortic dissection. All right, there are three things I want, but I don't know if you did them. What do you want, Doctor? I want a, I want a PTT mixing study. Although I don't think that will give us a diagnosis, but it will it will shed some light onto the onto the process of his coagulopathy. Right. Um, I want a, I want a dermatology for a skin biopsy because. I think that he's got bullous pemphigoid um, and dermatology is off, uh, often very helpful in thinking about uh, contributing underlying processes. But I think he's going to need a skin biopsy. Um, and I think we're going to see immune complex deposition below the basement membrane. That's how I always remember bullous pemphigoid is the immune complexes are below the basement membrane on immunofluorescence. Uh, and then, but I, I think that um, I don't have a great explanation for that significant eosinophilia. I think I'd like, I, I probably would involve hematology for consideration of a bone marrow biopsy. So uh, mixing studies take a while because uh, it's a send out study. Uh, we were still very concerned about the bleeding. Uh, so we ordered an angiogram. Um, a, a angiogram uh, abdomen and pelvis. So that angiogram um, did not show any contrast extravasation. Um, and he continued to bleed. Um, so he continued to have multiple um, blood product transf transfusion needs. Um, he, we had to put him on pressors because he became um, more hypotensive. Um, we got dermatology to see him. They did a biopsy and the biopsy is still pending to date. Uh, so I do not have the results of that biopsy. Oh, no. Um, we got a TT um, that showed a normal ejection fraction, uh, no valvular disease. Uh, he was, at, the, at this point, he was already on uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, and uh, he was just continued to uh, decline um, from a hemodynamic perspective. Um, next day... Um, after we were supporting him with pressors and blood transfusions, uh, those mix, 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 mixing studies came back. Um, so uh, let me just pull those here. Um, so um, the control PT uh, was 13.5. Uh, his PT after um, two hours was 14.3. The immediate mix uh, was 14, 15.1. Uh, post two hours mix was 15.1. So basically no change in his PT um, after uh, mixing studies. The PTT control for that day was 28.2. His immediate PTT was 70.6. And this is after he received um, uh, um, uh, K-Centra. Um, his two hour, uh, his pre two hour mix was 83.1 and his post two hour mix was 77.5. So his PTT then, was elevated after they mix it, after they mix they, Yeah, they, didn't correct well. And okay. so that you, you thought consistent with uh, an inhibitor. Correct. That's okay. What All right. What else do you want? We, we send inhibitors, um, and those took some time to come back. Um, I can I can give you some inhibitors. I, I want I want so at this point I want to ask the help of someone much smarter than me, which would be a hematologist uh, to to help me help me think through this. Because once I get to the once I get to the point of of ordering uh, PTT factor inhibitors. That's about that's about the limit uh, of of my hematology hematology knowledge in in that realm. But I'm still I'm still concerned about about an underlying malignancy, potentially a a, a primary marrow process. And so, 
if they did the bone marrow biopsy, I certainly would love that. So no bone marrow biopsy because he was very okay. sick um, and he was uh, like actively bleeding. Um, we were still concerned about bleeding. We were like, where is this bleeding coming from? Uh, we got GI on board. Um, we did a, a red blood cell um, tag scan, a uh, nuclear study. And the, re the tag red blood cells uh, showed um, extravasation. So it showed extravasation uh, of um, in the left lower quadrant um, in the sigmoid colon. Uh, so we got GI on board um, and they did a colonoscopy that showed uh, multiple diverticula, uh, but no specific um, diverticula that was specifically bleeding, but they did see um, ongoing bleeding. Uh, they could not intervene on any particular uh, diverticula. Um, we got the help from hematology um, and they were definitely concerned about an, an inhibitor. Um, so um, I'm going to tell you um, what those inhibitors showed. So we order um, IgA, IgG, and IgM for anticardiolipin, beta-2 microglobulin, and lupus anticoagulant. So anticardiolipins, IgA, IgM, and IgG were negative. Beta-2 microglobulin was negative as well. Uh, and lupus anticoagulant was positive. Um, we also ordered um, factor eight activity. Um, and um, I'm just gonna stop here. Um, should we just stop and do a problem representation or uh, should I just uh, uh, take everyone home? I'll tell you my, my just, just thinking a little bit more about, about this patient. You know, I, I think, and and th this is this is hindsight for me. The the oozing right is is secondary to this underlying process, and so I think even if you found a a, a little spot in the colon to intervene on, um, it's still right. It still doesn't it doesn't fix the underlying process. Um, but again, this this is hindsight, and this gentleman sounds very very sick and requiring a lot of blood product and resuscitation. Um, and then from a GI bleeding standpoint, CTA is great for someone that is unstable, hemodynamically unstable to find kind of a rapid bleed to localize. Um, but he sounds like the perfect person for a tag red cell scan, kind of just a slow ooze that you're just not sure where it's coming from. Um, but, you, you know, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, I've got a, a gentleman with a, a proximal kind of small bowel ooze that we were able to, to pick up on a tag red cell scan. And if it's somewhere potentially intervenable um, and you can save the patient um, blood product and, and the morbidity uh, of prolonged hospitalization, I think it's a, I think it's a, a, a good test. I think, you know, from a hematology perspective, you probably have to rule out uh, 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 lupus anticoagulant as the, the cause of the prolonged PTT. Hopefully, all of our pretest probabilities for lupus anticoagulant were were quite low, um, so I'm not surprised that uh, that the the antiphospholipid and anticardiolipin were negative. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a it's certainly a, a tough a tough problem uh, representation. I, I can tell you that the things that are still sticking out to me, the the bullous skin lesions. Um, the hyper eosinophilia, the um, ongoing bleeding and oozing in the setting of a, um, a prolonged PTT and a factor inhibitor. So for me, trying to tie this together, I still have the suspicion that there's an underlying, um, you know, either you know, hematologic or maybe less likely um, autoimmune process um, going on. But yeah, I'm I'm okay if everyone else is okay. It's six fifty six with you with you taking us home. Absolutely. So we got the factor eight activity, and the factor activity uh, um, was low, it was two percent. Uh, the normal range is fifty to one fifty, and we also order uh, titers for factor eight inhibitor, and uh, those were positive. Um, so. Um, the final the final working diagnosis for um, this case. Um, we uh, this is a acquired uh, factor eight inhibitor acquired hemophilia A. Um, the 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 way we treat uh, we treated this uh, was ideally with high dose steroids uh, as well as rituximab. Um, this patient um, 
protocols of care did not align with that treatment. Um, he had an ongoing infection. He had chronic osteomyelitis and starting rituximab, um, which is also part of the treatment to uh, get rid of the antibody that was causing the issue, um, was not going to be um, a possibility given his um, uh, active infection. Uh, he was also septic. Um, he grew um, providencia and pseudomonas in his blood cultures. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, that was something that, uh, precluded, um, giving uh, immune suppression. Um, he did get high dose steroids for, um, a, for a couple of days and that took care of the eosinophilia. We did not work up the eosinophilia and we don't have a good explanation why potentially related to dress. Uh, we don't know if a patient was starting on any other, uh, medications in that outside hospital, potentially related to vancomycin, uh, not sure, but given that, we started to realign goals of care. Um, we also stopped um, um, working him up uh, for for some of the other of his other medical problems. Um, basically, what hematology um, taught us is that um, this is a very rare condition. It's about two percent. Um, um, it happens in about two percent. Um, um, I think prevalence is like less than uh, uh, it's one. It's two in a million. It's like extremely rare. Um, and basically treatment, as I said, is with rituximab, high dose steroids, um, they can acquire, patients can, um, acquire remission, uh, within two months. Um, it is extremely rare associated with, uh, underlying malignancy and rheumatological, um, diseases, uh, all of his e ANAs, ENAs were negative. Um, he didn't have any stigmata of autoimmune disease. So potentially related to underlying malignancy, but um, that ideology we cannot um, explore. Um, we uh, wanted to uh, honor our patient's wishes and his family's wishes. And um, uh, he was transitioned to comfort measures um, and without further escalation. Um, he received um, FIBA, uh, which is a, a concentrate uh, that includes factor uh, seven, and he got better with factor seven. Uh, he also got K-Centra, which is um, vitamin K-related uh, coagulation factors, CU7, 9, and 10, as well as protein C CNS. Uh, uh, CNS. Um, and with the FIBA and the K-Centra, um, his bleeding stopped. Um, he uh, was transferred to the floor, um, and um, he, um, he did well. Uh, I don't know the most recent updates. Um, but uh, yeah, just very interesting case, um, very puzzling. Um, yeah, in incredibly, incredibly challenging um, heme case. Did, der did dermatology give, uh, did they have a, a working diagnosis? Did they think that this was uh, bullous pemphigoid? Yeah, so it was in their differential. They were concerned about edema bullae because uh, he had some. Um, oh right, okay. Bullet, uh, he had some edema, but they were definitely concerned about bullous pemphigoid uh, as well as IgA bullous dermatosis, uh, especially because he received vancomycin. Uh, okay. so those were um, his working diag their working diagnosis. Um, as I said, unfortunately, um, I don't have a skin biopsy. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, very, very, very cool case. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's challenging. I, I haven't I haven't gone that deep down down the hematology uh, rabbit hole in a while. So that was a great kind of refresher for my brain as well. I needed to choose a hematology case because he was not factor 12. It was factor eight. Oh, yeah. Next time. Next time we'll get factor 12 in there. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Malta Calderon, for the case and for the amazing discussion, Dr. Hemigan. And yeah, we, we want to know if you have any takeaways with you with, from this case. Um, the takeaways uh, that I learned, um, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I think one of the takeaways is that um, coagulopathy will manifest as a bleeding uh, in a patient uh, with underlying risk factors. So he was bleeding from a diverticular uh, a bleed, um, but in someone without a coagulopathy, diverticular bleeds are usually well controlled. Um, um, in his case, uh, his uh, diverticulosis and his diverticular bleed just persisted. And uh, as Dr. Hegman said, uh, the oozing in his urethra 
uh, as well as the, the epistaxis um, were concerning about acoagulopathy. Uh, the combination of those things uh, made us uh, think that, uh, um, and uh, of course the isolated PTT um, was something that made us um, uh, concerned about coagulopathy. Um, so I think the learning point is not to anchor uh, on just one side of bleeding, if there are other stigmata of bleeding um, in, a, in a patient with, uh, um, with an isolated PTT. Um, I think that was a learning point. And of course, when patients this sick, I have to you have to stabilize them, um, um, and that was our priority when uh, we took care of this patient in the ICU. Yeah, I I, I don't have uh, I don't have a whole lot more to add. I think I think we talked about the details of the case a lot, uh, and then and somebody that that is so sick like this. Um, with a, a number of baseline comorbidities to begin with, I think something the ICU team did uh, a remarkable job of resuscitating and 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 working up uh, extensively the the medical etiology, but at the same time focusing on the goals and values of the patient. And um, it sounds like thankfully being able to sit down and hopefully talk with the patient and family. And it sounds like appropriately kind of got those goals addressed. And because it sounds like this is a case that had those goals not been addressed, he might still be in the ICU and you might still be going and going and going and going. And is that is that really um, in the patient's best interest and in, in what he would want um, out of out of the, the rest of his life? And so I think it sounds like you, you all did a did a great job and um, he's sounds like he's improving and is in the in, in the right place and a little bit less uh, intensive care and, and hopefully transitioning to potential, is he potentially transitioning to, to comfort or going home or? I know the most recent updates. Yeah, uh, okay. But uh, uh, yeah, hopefully uh, um, we're honoring his wishes um, and uh, we just um, um, de-escalated care. Gotcha, yep. All right, yeah, that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Mata, for the case, for the discussion, Dr. Hamigan. We have some teaching points from Bettina before we end the session. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the incredible case and discussion. So um, let's focus on the main teaching points for this session. So central to our case was the bleeding in our patient. And when we talk about bleeding, there are a lot of differentials that we can think of, like the IC, we can look at the different um, processes that are affected, the extrinsic versus the intrinsic pathway, or even the terminal pathway that is common to both. And then we can also check for platelet dysfunction, thrombocytopenia, and then, of course, the ongoing um, GI bleeding and possible acquired coagulopathy. So our patient actually had a prolonged PTT, and from there, we can further narrow our differentials to um, possible heparin and oxaparin prophylaxis that the patient may have taken beforehand. It could be lupus anticoagulant, von Willebrand factor deficiency because VWF also carries factor eight. So it can not only affect the bleeding time, but also the PTT. And then of course, we also have our factor eight inhibitor. So it is important in this case to do a mixing study and see if it corrects. And then um, to look for the source of the bleeding as well, it's also very important because we have to prioritize the stabilization of our patient while simultaneously exploring the underlying disease. So we can do CT angio for a hemodynamically unstable patient, but we can also do a tag red cell scan if we are still unsure about the source of the bleeding. And then we also talked about eosinophilia, which also could have a lot of differentials. And a few of them that jumped out were hyperusinophilic syndrome with multi-organ infiltration. It could be a marrow process like a myeloproliferative neoplasm with factor deficiencies. It can be a hypersensitivity reaction to the patient's allopurinol, or it could be parasitic, which is probably least likely in our case right now. We also talked about um, markedly elevated vitamin B12 a little bit in our case, and a couple of people also mentioned in the chat that it could be due to hyperosinophilic syndrome as well, and it could also point us to uh, bone marrow malignancy. And then lastly, uh, we talked about our final diagnosis, which is the acquired factor eight inhibitor. And some learning points for that would be that it is extremely rare, around 2% in the population. 
And usually it is treated with rituximab and high dose steroids. And the patient can acquire remission in two months. And usually it is associated with underlying malignancy or rheumatologic diseases. So that's it for today. Wow, those are amazing uh, um, teaching points. Thanks so much for compiling those. Um, wow. Awesome. Yeah. Just, I'll just summary. correct it's a, it. It's a, a one to two cases per million, uh, not 2%. <laughs> but those were, those were amazing teaching points. Agreed. Yeah. Thank you so much for the session. It was really great and we, we really appreciate it. So thank you so much, Bettina, for the teaching points. We hope to see you all tomorrow for our VMR. Bye. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.